Thanks again. So I think this is a very contemporary topic because we are living in an aging society. If you look here, you know, if you really want to look at the life expectancy, you should look at the charts of uh, insurance company and governmental agencies rather than uh, medical reports. And this is the uh, life expectancy nowadays uh, here in North America. So you can see that if you are at the octogenarians, octogenarians for the sake of this talk is 80 years old, 80 to 90, and nanogenarians are 90 to uh, and plus. And you can see, so if when you hit uh, um, uh, 80, you still have at least seven years as a male and uh, nine years or more as a female. So we are actually talking about an increased population that, and I'll show you data, has more bladder cancer. And they're actually destined to live quite long if they are um, in the average, uh, in the average um, um, risk. So if you lead, lead, for example, to 90 years old, you're expected to live about four years if you're a male and four and a half or five years if you're a female. So we have to bury these figures in mind. And the probability of developing a muscle invasive bladder cancer increases with age. So currently in the United States, the, ever, the median, not even the mean, uh, age of diagnosis is 73 years old. And as we grow up, we see that um, the uh, number catches up and significantly in males over the age of 70. So it's a very common uh, phenomenon. And indeed, this is data from uh, our uh, multidisciplinary uh, bladder cancer clinic. Um, you can see that the third, at least, of the patients uh, are nano and octogenarians. And those are coming to a tertiary referral center to uh, get um, an opinion regarding and even takeover, obviously, uh, of therapy um, in their specific situation. So why is bladder cancer or muscle invasive bladder cancer so common in elderly uh, patients? So it may be that it's a more aggressive superficial disease. There's certainly an element of delaying diagnosis and probably uh, some different biology. In terms of uh, more aggressive superficial bladder cancer, there is uh, plenty of papers about that. This is just uh, one that is very interesting, looking at the differences in terms of progression and recurrence in patients that received, um, <clears throat> that had uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, they received a TRBT and uh, intravesical BCG. And you, one can see that age was an independent risk factor for tumor recurrence and progression. Essentially, recurrence was 2.3 times in patients over the age of 80 compared to uh, younger patients. Up. And this is another way to look at the data. Uh, you can see the significant odds of recurring, recurring and progressing, even despite the um, intervocycle BCG and the TRBT in elderly patients. Delaying diagnosis, this is very common, unfortunately, and we see it more and more. And this is data from Hollenbeck, and you can see that it's not uncommon to have a delay of diagnosis of even a year. And this is usually happening because of a very prosaic reasons, okay? Granny has hematuria, she has some lower urinary tract symptoms, the GP puts a stick, a dipstick, obviously there will be white blood cells and red blood cells because it's, it's a tumor there and they prescribe her with antibiotics. There is no urine culture, nothing. So the common complaint is that I had urinary infections for a year until they found it. No. And I insist that if you do have, if you call something urinary tract infection, show me the, the urine culture. Show me that there was a bacteria there that caused uh, uh, things. And I see it a lot and a lot and a lot in my clinic. So there is certainly a delay in diagnosis. But once it's diagnosed, we have a very uh, poor, um, we, we poorly addressed that. This is a paper by uh, Gore et al. and shows that only 21% of muscle invasive bladder cancer patients over the age of 65 here actually received radical cystectomy. Those, uh, he shows also that there was a better over survival, but obviously this is biased by selection. But if you look here, um, another study that looked at the National Cancer uh, Database, you can see that the older you are, the less chance that you will receive treatment. Indeed, half of the patients that are over age 80, um, sorry, 85, received any type of therapy for their muscle invasive bladder cancer. Not to speak about cystectomy, which is the uh, very uh, um, bold uh, gray there. So the natural history of muscle invasive bladder cancer. So why is it okay to leave it untreated? Someone is 85. Well, I think we, most of us in this room will uh, we'll agree that if left untreated, most patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer 
will have significant morbidity and will die for the disease within two years of diagnosis. So a life expectancy of two years has been suggested um, to be a, a benchmark for, to consider radical cystectomy. So you can't just not treat it if someone is destined to live five, six, eight, or nine years from even if they're, they're elderly. Again, this is reflected here. So the perception would be, well, those are elderly patients. They will not tolerate radical cystectomy and urinary diversion because, they're a because of their age, fertility, other comorbidities. And what we do is we usually eyeball that. But that's wrong. And we need to get over that and incorporate tools that have been suggested by, for example, the Geriatric Society to better risk stratify patients for uh, cancer patients for uh, major cancer surgeries. And you can see that age can be only a chronological marker and not necessarily a functional marker. And there are many uh, tests and many algorithms that we do not use, frankly, as urologists, as medical oncologists, potentially uh, radiation oncologists, we don't use them. For example, how many of you do use the activity of daily living, the instrumental activity of daily living, the geriatric depression scale, for example, to assess your, um, when you come to decide whether to do a radical cystectomy on an elderly patient. And these um, <clears throat> scales has been shown to be associated with 30 days mortality. I guess few of us do it because we are not aware of that or we are just ignoring it. And behind the risk assessment, behind getting a number, I think it's very important and it's, it's not really a nursing talk, but really, really have to be very conscientious of these two elements. First of all, we have to balance the discussion about quality of life because this is very, very important, this age population. But also, for example, looking if there is an effective caregiver. Why? Because an effective caregiver can prevent the transformation of disability to a handicap. If you have an illal conduit and you don't have any caregiver that can take care of that, you're handicapped. You're not dis disabled. And this is very, very important. So. Radical cystectomy for elderly patients. Uh, most of the series, I have to, uh, have to say, I mean, obviously they're retrospective and they're quite uh, old, but you can see that um, um, if you compare um, experitive surgery and other treatment modalities, that has the best uh, cancer-specific survival, at least according to these studies and other studies. This is the SEER data of about 11,000 uh, consecutive patients with mass-invasive bladder cancer. About 8,000 of them underwent radical cystectomy, and close to 3,000 had bladder preservation, and that had to include radiation therapy. They excluded a patient that had, they had no data on stage, grade, uh, uh, CIS, PT1, et cetera. And what you can see that the overall survival superpassed and was significantly more in patients at all ages with a bladder cancer, including octogenarians. Cancer-specific survival followed the same. And in fact, patients who had radical cystectomy had better cancer-specific survival regardless of age um, if uh, no positive cases were excluded for octogenarians. This is a summary of uh, several literatures that are out there, of the literature that is out there. And you can see generally, uh, and the definition is usually octogenarians, so patients over the age of 80. And you can see that you can, one can achieve an overall survival in five years of about a, a third. So 35% overall survival, and cancer-specific survival of around 45, 40 to 45%. And again, this is something that may be important to patients that are destined to live another five years. We have to uh, acknowledge, though, that octogenarians that are undergo uh, radical cystectomy are often found with a more aggressive disease. Now. We in our clinic, in our uh, multidisciplinary clinic, tend not to recommend often new adjuvant chemotherapy for octogenarian and nanogenarians. Um, I will be interested to discuss that uh, potentially with, 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 the, with the forum. Uh, but the idea is that pay the studies that showed the benefit for new adjuvant chemotherapy usually translate to five years from the new adjuvant chemotherapy. So if your expected survival would be five years, I'm not sure that the 5% advantage of survival within five years justify the morbidity of new adjuvant chemotherapy. But bear in mind that octogenarians and nanogenarians will have a more aggressive disease on pathology. So uh, radical cystectomy massive invasive bladder cancer in the octogenarians, obviously in the nanogenarian, is associated with the highest survival rate as compared to other treatment strategies. This is suggested by uh, a retrospective analysis, which is obviously biased. 
and the T stage is typically more advanced. The question is, is it safe? Uh, this is the most uh, um, quoted study uh, from Memorial Sloan Catering by Harry Heron and Michelle Donat. They looked at their uh, um, um, almost 1,200 uh, patients that underwent radical cystectomy at Memorial and compare a, a between uh, patients that were older than 80 and, uh, and younger than 80. And uh, what they found essentially is that there was no significant uh, change uh, in, in the rate of minor or major complication after uh, treatment um, 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 after they adjusted to baseline characteristics. But please pay attention, there was higher overall 90-day um, mortality rate of about 6.8%, 7%. Most studies report that, that radical cystectomy is safe in the octogenarians and the overall mortality is 4%. However, this increase uh, to, uh, up to 10% in, um, in 90 days mortality. But actually, all of these studies are retrospective and are a highly selected population. So, uh, but we have to recall, and if you look, think of the alternative, is that death by untreated uh, bladder cancer is much more common than death related to the intercurrent medical diseases, uh, and the quality of life during the survival time is strongly affected. So we have to do something. So what are the other alternative options? Well, let's talk about potential TRBT only, bladder sparing, radiation therapy, um, and uh, omitting the diversion. So TRBT only, uh, this is the Solsona famous uh, paper looking at a very highly selective pop patient population. Uh, they had to be patients uh, with uh, no T3 disease, so N2, uh, T2 only. Uh, he excluded two tumors that were over three centimeters, no patients with hydronephrosis and obviously with uh, lymphadenopathy. Uh, he did uh, include patients with multifocal disease and CIS, and this is a 15 years follow-up. And what you can see that in this very highly selected patients, and there, you add to the selection because you have to have negative biopsies, at least five of them, of the tumor bed after you complete the TRBT, but in a very highly selected patients, say 85 with a tumor size of less than C centimeter, that you can achieve that, perhaps you're doing the, the best thing because you can get a, a, a five-year survival of 70%, uh, um, as you can see there. <clears throat> Partial cystectomy, there is very few data, none in octogenarian. This is just a series from a, a, a West Kasuf. So I uh, will omit that because we really don't have enough data. Bladder sparing. So this, we get this often to our multidisciplinary bladder cancer clinic. Can you do bladder sparing for that? Well, we know that, um, that there are issues with eligibility and we can uh, relate it to oncological. High proportion of octogenarian uh, uh, patients do have locally advanced disease, hydronephrosis and so forth. They're obviously not fitted. Radiation. If someone has significant incontinence, very small capacity bladder just from aging, that can cause some significant side effect. Salvage radical cystectomy, if you fail, will be hard. But most importantly, I think, is the ability to tolerate the cisplatin. And if you're a believer that you have to have a, a, a GFR or creatinine clearance of over 60 ml per minute, then uh, we know that it, um, only 60% or so of the elderly would have it. So. What I think is that if your patient can really not tolerate radical cystectomy, what are the really odds that he can get the full, um, the full uh, package of um, bladder sparing? I think quite low, and we do have some, we didn't publish that, but uh, data from our own uh, uh, bladder cancer clinic. Yes, you don't have to give certainly um, a cisplatin uh, chemotherapy uh, in combination with the bladder preservation. This is a very nice study from England, which was published, I believe, two years ago in New England Journal of Medicine. Here they used um, five FU, uh, FU and mitomycin C um, as uh, radiation as, um, a, a, a combined with radiation. They had to have GFR of over 25, which is a significant discount. And they could see that the five years over survival was about 48% for the chemo um, radiation arm. So I think it's quite reasonable if someone has a five years survival, uh, or sorry, five years the life expectancy expected. This is something to consider. Um, with respect to the diversion, I, I missed here the slides, uh, but we know that the majority of the morbidity from radical cystectomy actually relates to the, uh, to the uh, bowel uh, part of the surgery. And it happened to me that if there are patients that really need the radical cystectomy, for example, for a salvage, significant bleeding, um, significant disease, but they had 
previous subdominal operations and they already have nephrostomies, oftentimes I would make with them a deal. I'd say, let's go and do a proper radical cystectomy, lymph node dissection, which we, I omitted here in the talk, but we do have to give the same lymph node dissection to our uh, octogenarians uh, 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 patient, and have you with two nephrostomies. And I think this is a very good compromise, and I could tell you from my uh, limited experience, they recover from that very well. So uh, to wrap up, the take-home message, I think, is that muscle invasive bladder cancer is common in octogenarians. Special attention should be paid to an early detection, so don't uh, accept just um, a title of UTI or so forth. You have to investigate that. Recurrence and progression of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer are more common in octogenarians. Compared to other treatment, radical cystectomy seems to result in the best oncological outcome in octogenarians with muscle invasive bladder cancer. Again, this is not a prospective uh, data. Um, the risk of complication in radical cystectomy elderly men uh, <clears throat> is influenced by medical conditions rather by, uh, than the chronological age. And we do have geriatric tools, and we do have other tools that can better risk stratify the risk. So we cannot just eyeball them and exclude them from surgery. Radical cystectomy can be done safely in octogenarium. I think, and this is uh, something that we, we did, obviously, we assembled a good support team, so it's more than the surgeon. I think it's a support team, cardiologist, ICU, geriatrician, nutritionist, occupational therapist, social worker, and so forth, because we have not only to get them through the surgery, but rather have them living a decent quality of life after surgery. The option of radical cystectomy should not be withheld uh, from appropriately selected octogenarian, but this is a very balanced uh, talk, and ultimately, after you uh, uh, present everything, you have to uh, obviously prospect and understand the patient perspective, because he or she are older than you. Thank you. <laughs>